All right, good night, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to React Denver this August. Um, oop. What's going on here? Okay, uh, I know a lot of you have already found the pizza, as evidenced by all the empty boxes. Uh, if you didn't, feel free to come and get some food. There's even salad, there's drinks down there. Uh, all that stuff's up here. Uh, if you need restrooms, there are a couple restrooms right on the other side of this wall, uh, kind of straight down the hallway there. And then there's also some back by the elevators. Uh, we'd like to thank, uh, tonight we've got uh, obviously Turing for the space. Um, and then also Granicus who sponsors our meetup fee. And then our sponsor for the event this evening who is paying for all your delicious pizza is exactly. And I will hand the mic over for a sec so that somebody from exactly can talk about exactly and what exactly it is. Thank you. Um, get that joke all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so I'm David and um, I'm one of the organizers here for the meetup. And yeah, thank you so much to exactly for sponsoring it. Um, so we are a tech company here in Denver. Um, we are currently growing our Denver office, so we don't currently have any React openings at the current moment, but um, we are growing quickly, and so we might in the near future. Um, what we do, uh, we do mostly incentive compensation. Um, so we've got a kind of a multi-tenant uh, product suite for that where we cover all sorts of aspects in terms of sales management and um, compensation for the sales cycle. So if you have any questions, feel free to catch me after the meetup, and I will answer any of them. Thanks. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so we just heard that Exactly is hiring. Um, if is there who's from Race Monitor? You want to come talk about it for a sec? My name is Mark Lubisher, uh, one of the founders of Race Monitor. It's a live timing and scoring app in real time of auto racing, go-kart racing, motorcycles. British Lawnmower Racing Association even uses it. It's kind of crazy racing. <laughs> uh, we've got over a million users uh, looking to expand um, our line of products and are looking for a senior React Native developer. Cool, thanks. Uh, Quizlet? I'm Kevin Gorski, and uh, Quizlet is an app for teachers and students to study and run classroom activities and also do flashcard-based uh, studying. Uh, it's a San Francisco-based company, and we're starting a Denver office. So I'm actually the first engineering hire. So there's uh, going to be a, a pod here, and um, primarily we're first looking for senior full-stack devs in uh, React, Redux, and Node. Uh, somebody, I know there's a couple formidable guys. Gosh, I'm, I'm just so honored to be here. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it probably thank God first. Um, so, I am Chris Bolin. I work at Formidable. Uh, my, my friendly colleague Sam Well wrote this, though, because he has much nicer handwriting than I do. Uh, Formidable is an open source and uh, JavaScript consultancy. So, we do work for clients and we do some open source stuff. We are starting a Denver office. Um, we've kind of had it running for about a year now, built up a couple people. So if you are a senior React engineer, you self-identify as that, and you're interested in working with us, um, give me a shot, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And Mr. Will Klein, take it home. So I am at Workday. Actually, I'm on leave at Workday. I'm on week five of 12, and I'm not allowed to take your email. But we need somebody to work on my team, and I've put my friend Shannon Hasty's uh, email up there. She was uh, my recruiter friend, so if you're interested in working at Workday, talk to me, or better yet, email her, and I'd like to have you on my team. Cool. Thanks, Will. All right. Uh, I don't think we have any announcements. I put the, I should probably fast forward to the conferences slide. I put it later. All right. Don't peek at those. Okay. Oh, yeah. Will, come back here. I'll just throw all those up. You can talk about them. 
Thank you. Yeah, so I want to talk about some upcoming conferences. If there's any that you know about that aren't on here, tell me. But Develop Denver is coming back in October this year instead of August. Um, React Conf is happening in October as well. I got hooked up with a ticket from a friend here who's sharing that with me. They had a ticket lottery, so I might be too late to get a ticket. But if you are going, tell me, because I'm going. I'd love to talk to more people going. Uh, and Cascadia JS is in November. And they took like a year off last year. I've been wanting to go for ages. I'm going this year. And they have a really awesome 50% discount code for React Denver, which I'm going to put as a comment on the meetup. I'll put, a, I'll put links to all these on the meetup event. I'll comment on it in like two minutes. And uh, I'm excited about all that. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Will. OK, I didn't miss anything. Good. Um, and then, at, oh, I actually did. Guy, who made these? They're all out of order. Um, yeah, so just real quick, uh, we are looking to schedule speakers for uh, September and beyond. September's next month. Um, if you have a talk you'd like to give, if you have a topic that you'd like to you know, kind of talk to somebody about turning into a talk, um, anything like that, you can come find me, you can come talk to Will, come talk to any of the kind of organizers, um, and we would love to have you. And with that, I will turn it over to Madison Kent, who's going to talk to us about building React apps with end-to-end -end encryption. Let's give her a hand. that work? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm. Okay. All right. All right. Hello. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Huge thank you uh, to the organizers. I know how much work it is putting on the meetup every month. Um, and you guys always do a great job. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Madison. I'm here to talk to you about how to add end-to-end uh, -end encryption to your React application. So before I jump in, quick show of hands. Who uses React um, in their day job? I'm assuming a lot of you. Awesome. OK. Now, um, who uses, uh, is familiar with Redux? OK. And middlewares? Awesome. Good. OK. Great. OK. Uh, one last question. So when I say uh, encryption, what do you think about? Security. OK. What else? Cryptography. Cryptography. OK. Private keys, public and private keys, what else? <laughs> Secrets, keep going. Hashing, okay, awesome. So typically when I ask this question, uh, one thing that kind of comes up is uh, HTTPS as a solution of how to add encryption uh, to an application. Now this is an example of encryption in transit. Uh, and it covers data when it's uh, traveling through a network. And it protects against uh, tools like network sniffers. Um, and that's really all it does. So it does protect our applications. OK. And another kind of set of common answers that I'll hear um, are basically under the data store encryption umbrella. So this applies to S3 buckets, uh, MongoDB uh, encry encryption modules, um, and uh, basically disk encryption. These all fall under the umbrella of uh, encryption at rest. 
And what a common myth that I hear with encryption is that encryption in transit and encryption at rest is equal to end-to-end -end encryption. But that's really not the case. Uh, and I'm going to say that again. So encryption in transit plus encryption at rest is not equal to end-to-end -end encryption. Let me tell you why. So here in this diagram, what you'll see is that we're encrypting data uh, in transit. And that data gets decrypted and then encrypted again once it hits that service layer. At that point, we lose control over that data. And Facebook Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica example is a, is a great kind of use case where we saw where things went wrong. Facebook used uh, encryption at, in transit and encryption at rest, yet they lost control over it when the, one of their trusted vendors uh, shared it with a third party, Cambridge Analytica. And even when they knew the problem was happening, they didn't have any recourse because they did not have any control over that, da um, <laughs> that data anymore. So maybe uh, Mark Zuckerberg can handle to lose $120 billion of market value, but that's not something that I'm really looking forward to. I don't know about you guys. End-to-end -end encryption is a solution to this problem where we encrypt data at the point of origin and it stays encrypted through our entire process uh, until the end point of use. Our point of view is that data is not secure unless it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, and our applications can't be considered private or secure unless we're using end-to-end -end encryption. So what I've just explained to you is really the concepts of why end-to-end -end encryption is important. Uh, and now I'm going to dig in a little bit more into the code, and I'm going to show you a use case of how we can fit end-to-end uh, -end encryption into our app using uh, typical architectures that it sounds like most of you guys use uh, with Redux, middlewares, uh, things that we use in production-level applications, um, and where it slides really well uh, into that use case. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about groups and some of the added benefits that groups give you in terms of protecting data in your application. So let's jump into the code. So there is, as front-end developers, we know that there's a natural seam between our application and uh, sending data across the line, right? This did not, is not always as clean as we would like, but it is a really good kind of use case for us to slide in uh, a solution where we can uh, basically uh, access data before it's sent across the wire and then re-access it once data is sent back to us. So how many of you have seen a, this diagram before? OK. So uh, for architects, this is an uh, implementation of CQRS which stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And for the rest of us, uh, this is Redux. So essentially how Redux works, for those of us who don't uh, know, um, we are dispatching actions from components of our application. We're sending them to our global store. Um, and we are essentially listening via our dispatcher um, to those actions combining them with the current state of our application, deducing that down to a single state of our app, and then propagating that down to the components of our app. And we subscribe our components, or we connect them, to listen to state changes that are relevant to them, and then re-render uh, uh, re those components where it matters. Now, in the Redux model, middleware fits right in here. You'll see that middleware, middleware has, there's a bunch of different types of middleware. And essentially, a middleware is a third party extension that stands kind of in that seam between dispatching an action, um, and be, does something to that information, and then uh, before it comes back to that reducer. So in the example of Redux Thunk, we send out a uh, call, and in that scene, we're waiting for information to come back to us from our server, and then we can then update our state based on that information. This works really well for things like logging, like I said, with uh, uh, asynchronous API calls. And it also works really well for encryption. Um, did that go through? 
So I'm going to walk you through the code to implement um, end-to-end -end encryption via a middleware in our React app. So I'll start with uh, this function here, and now I can't see. Um, so here, here we've got our uh, encryption middleware, and we're essentially um, hooking in um, to those calls inside of our Redux state. So when we're going to dispatch an action, we're listening to something. Um, and then here we're calling through our middleware, which is going to listen to every action that's dispatched and decide whether to do something or not to do something. And in this case, we're going to listen for the action of add blood test. And this is something that highly s has highly sensitive information that we need to encrypt. So every, uh, um, every action will kind of go through this middleware function and we'll only listen to the ones that are relevant. And then for the ones that are relevant, we're going to call the encrypt blood test function, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, don't worry about that now. And uh, manipulate the data before we pass it through to our app. Now, this next uh, action is essentially if um, nothing needs to happen or we are listening to an action that doesn't apply to us, move on. So the decryption middleware works very similarly, where essentially we're hooking in um, to our succession of middlewares, we're listening to our get blood test uh, action, and then we're going to do something according if, if we hit it. Again, passing through if we don't need to uh, access that, that data. Okay, so now going on to uh, encryption. So in this example, I'm using uh, IronCore's uh, encryption solution. Th you could use any other encryption solution in this architecture, uh, the middleware and, uh, and hooking into Redux. Um, IronCore has some added benefits of key management and um, groups, which I'll talk about later. Um, but all you need to know here is that we're passing in data that we want to encrypt uh, in this action. And that's, that's passing in the information that was passed in through the action payload, uh, for those who are uh, quite familiar with Redux. And then once that data is manipulated, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass that back to my app. That will change the global state of my app and will propagate down. So you may have noticed that I skipped this access list. I will come back to it uh, in a little bit, but just keep this in mind and keep it top of mind. Um, it it'll will, will become important. Okay, so now I have my decrypt blood test, and this works very similarly to the encrypt function. I'm using Iron Core again in this case. Um, I am hooking into the middleware via my the function that I showed you uh, previously. Now I'm calling my decrypt function, passing in a informa information ID or a document ID is what we call that, uh, and the data that we want to be decrypted. And then I, once that ha decryption happens, I'm passing that through to my app and then can respond accordingly. So what I've just shown you is a very, very simple seam that I'm handling all encryption and decryption through one tiny seam of my application. I'm not handling in any individual component. It's not speckled throughout my app. It's very simple and very clean. I've shown you encryption and decryption. So this is really the one, two, three step. Ah. Uh, <laughs> it wouldn't be a good presentation if there, a dev presentation, if there wasn't a GIF, right? I'm just going to let him keep going. Okay, so uh, now we're going to kind of step into the bonus section where we're I'm going to cover the idea of groups and some of the benefits uh, that that gives you in an app. A, so remember this example that I told you to kind of keep top of mind uh, just a couple of minutes ago? Well, this idea, what you'll notice is that there's a keyword of groups here. And groups allow us to separate uh, the decision of what data to encrypt with the decision of who should have access to that data. Now, I'm going to say that again because it's really quite nuanced, the fact that we're separating that decision. Groups allow us to separate the decision of what data to encrypt 
from the decision of who should have access to that data. Let's look at an example. So here I've got personal, personal health information. Um, and I want to encrypt it and make sure that that remains secure. Um, it's obviously very private, and I don't want uh, only everybody to be able to see it. So I'm going to go ahead and encrypt that data. And then later, afterwards, I'm going to decide what hospital I want to allow to see that data. Maybe I don't know what hospital I want to go to, or maybe I'm moving cities or changing doctors. Who knows? But it's after the initial data has already been encrypted. Then I can grant access to uh, parties that need access to that information, such as my doctor, potentially a nurse um, that's helping me, uh, a lab that I've gotten done, uh, or an insurance company that I need to share with. And let's just say I was monitoring how my insurance company was using my information, and I, they were looking at too much. I don't, I don't feel comfortable with them having that level of access to my info. Groups allow us to revoke access without touching the underlying data. So I can cryptographically decide that I do not want somebody to see my data and not have to have access to the underlying uh, uh, data there. And just a quick point here, what I do want to uh, mention is that in our definition of end-to-end -end encryption, we said that data is encrypted from the point of origin to the end use. And in our blood test search index, this can be a service. So our blood test uh, search index is a service that may need to index uh, my, my blood type information and associate it with an arbitrary ID that's not personally identifiable. And let's just say I want to give them access to do that. It can go ahead and run that query one time. Uh, I have complete control over how that query is being run. And it still applies, fits under the definition of end-to-end -end encryption uh, because it is at the point of use still. What we call this is orthogonal access control. And this is the academic term. Now, in the market, we call this data control. And data control is the ability to determine who can access data, uh, see how that data is being used, by whom, and the ability to revoke access at any time, no matter where the data lives. So this data can be stored on disk, it can be stored at my hospital, it could be stored uh, on my personal computer or even in the cloud. So if your application is not using end-to-end -end encryption, my point of view is that it's not private nor secure. And some of the adi added benefits of data control is that it gives you the ability to see who has access to your data, how that data is being used, and the ability to revoke access from any individual user or malicious party at any time. Do I have any questions? Yeah, so uh, the way that I would answer that, um, so did everybody hear the question okay? Okay. Um, so essentially you can have a uh, certain actions, there's a couple ways you can handle it, but you could handle it in one way of having certain actions dispatch for sensitive information. So that was really how we handled it in this example, where we only wanted to call the encrypt function if we were uh, sending blood test information. Another way you could potentially handle that is through kind of the model of your data. So you could say that um, for certain types of information, I'm requiring that this be encrypted. You can have that middleware listen for that, that Boolean um, and then call only if that Boolean is up to true. Sure, clarify.
So um, l let me make sure I'm understanding your question correctly. So what you're saying is if you add encryption to your application level layer, with yeah, so it's a, it's a client side encryption solution. Yep. So it's encrypted on your application, and then uh, the other processes like HTTPS and then server side encryption would all happen as separate processes. Your front end application would not worry about this, but this would be an added layer uh, that really adds an end encryption to your entire process. Does that make sense? No, it's your it's a front end front end middleware. It's implemented uh, via an SDK um, that's part of your front end app. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that during the talk. Yeah. So this would be to add, uh, so this would be to add end-to-end -end encryption to your app, and to provision certain services to have access. So you're adding uh, a complete solution to your application. Uh, so I think what you're saying in in your kind of definition is that you're using TLS and you're using kind of HTTPS and then the server-side encryption as your solutions. Is that correct? Yeah, and if you want some additional resources on that, I'm happy to share them with you. Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, so actually that goes directly back to kind of this, this use case here of kind of our blood uh, type search index where we can create a service that has limited time access to be able to uh, index information. So in your example of the flu uh, uh, example, right, we would say here's the number of people that had the flu, connect them with an ID, but it has no PII or personally identifiable association uh, information associated um, with the fact, the fact of whether somebody had a flu or not. Right? So we could create a, a service uh, that it would essentially handle that for us without uh, uh, exposing the full uh, personal health information of a, a particular user. Okay. Probably yeah, uh, that's it for questions. So thanks everybody so much. So and uh, also, oh, go ahead, Maddie. Um, last thing, if anybody's uh, interested in learning uh, more, um, DM me or hit me up after the the talk or and after um, the next talk, and I'd be happy to share um, some resources with you and also a fully working re uh, repo of the code that I just showed. So uh, if you like uh, Star Trek, it's for you. And then if you're interested in learning more about uh, orthogonal access control and uh, some of those resources, happy to send them. Thanks, Maddie. <laughs> All right, next up we have John Bella, who's gonna talk to us about state machines. Widescreen, right? <laughs> that would have been sweet. We all settled? Awesome. So this is going to be uh, demystifying state machines. Uh, my name is John Bella. I'm a front-end engineer at TED. Uh, I work with the conferences team doing uh, apps that you would see if you attend a TED conference. Um, based here in Denver, our office is in New York. Uh, so before I dive into what state machines are and what they can do for you, um, I think it's best to start with a history lesson. Because I think that the journey to get to this point probably mimics what a lot of you have experienced as well. Um, so a long, long time ago, like six or seven years, um, which the Stone Age practically, uh, state management for me typically was direct DOM manipulation with jQuery. Um, when my page refreshed, I had no real concept of what the state of the application was anymore which led me to the decision or the determination that state is hard. So then I moved on to Backbone. I was doing a lot of WordPress at the time. WordPress had uh, a lot of Backbone in the back end of it. Um, doing my MV star, doing two-way data binding, kind of getting, getting in the groove with that. Um, but state was still hard. So through a, a, a route that took me through Angular and a couple other frameworks, I, I landed uh, on React where I started kind of using the flux pattern and, and having my unidirectional data flow passing down through my components and 
that was nice. Set state's awesome. But state was still hard. Um, so I thought Redux would be the answer. So I added Redux, have my reducers and my actions and all this stuff. Uh, state, still hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why? Why is state so hard? Because state was implicit. As I looked at the code that I was writing, a lot of the code looked like this. So if the state is error, show, do something. Or if, there, if it is error and I'm not fetching anymore, do something else. Or is error, is empty, is fetching, is success, is loading. I imagine, raise your hand if you have components that use more than three of these. A lot of you, yeah. So the reason state was hard is because, well, I forgot I had this one in there. <laughs> so the reason state was hard is because state was implicit. Um, and what I was doing is, this approach is called the event action paradigm, where an event happens in your application and you respond to that event. There's no concept of what the current state is. It's just which of my Boolean flags are true and which are false. And that's really difficult to reason about, especially if someone else writes the code and you come in there and, and are trying to figure out what's happening. It's, it's very difficult to figure out. Um, this is also called the bottom-up approach. Uh, in a book in the mid-90s, Ian Horrocks, uh, who's a professor of CS at Oxford, wrote a book called Constructing the User Interface with State Charts. Um, it was not about user interfaces as we think of them today. The examples in the book are all about like watches and Walkmans and things like that. But the, the pieces of the bottom-up approach or event action paradigm that he identified as difficult were it's difficult to understand, it's difficult to test, if you're testing these Boolean flags, you run out of, you, you just don't have good coverage for those components. Um, contains bugs even after testing and fixing. If any of this feels like you're being seen right now, me too. Um, it's difficult to enhance. So if you're writing a lot of Boolean flags and you go in to add new pieces of state, that component kind of, you lose control of it really quickly. Uh, and code quality deteriorates uh, as features are added. So What's the answer? So I went searching and landed on state machines. And so I started diving into state machines, and a state machine can be defined as an abstract machine that can be in one of a finite number of states at any time. So if that is confusing right now, I'll clear it up in just a minute, but that's the academic definition of it. It falls under the, uh, you're already writing state machines. So with these Boolean flags, Technically, you're already writing state machines because you have a finite number of states. It just is whatever, you know, your Boolean flag count is times two and any kind of things you're doing like that. So there are finite number, there's a finite number of states. It's just that they're implicit, which is what's difficult. Um, so this is the event state action paradigm, which means that an event happens in your application. You tell your state machine what happened. It transitions into a new state and then your application responds to that new state. So it's, it's finite and deterministic, which falls under the automata theory and the deterministic finite automata category of automata theory, which is the study of abstract machines and computer science and the problems that can be solved with them. Um, and deterministic finite automata means that you have a finite number of states and those states are deterministic, meaning that if an event happens in your application, it is, it, you, you know exactly what's going to happen with that. There's no guesswork involved. So your state becomes explicit. Um, it's actually, uh, it was developed, state machines were actually developed in the early 1940s um, and are backed by a mathematical concept. Um, so sigma is the input alphabet. S is a finite non-empty set of states. S0 is an initial state. Delta is the state transition function, and F is the final set of states. It's not really important for the rest of this talk to know this stuff. <laughs> so there's not going to be a quiz. Uh, but it is cool to know that the way you're building applications is backed by uh, a lot of mathematics over several decades. Um, so I hope you feel smart now. Um, so this is a state machine. So imagine in Microsoft Word or Google Docs or whatever you use, you have a bold button that when you click the bold button, 
text becomes bold, you click it again, text goes back to regular. So that is a deterministic finite set of states. Those states are explicit, it's regular or bold. Um, the problem with state machines though, is that as you start adding, state machines have no concept of depth or anything. So arrows start kind of going all over the place. And this is known as state explosion. Um, and it's the biggest problem with state machines. So in the early 1980s, a guy named David Harrell started working with Israel Aircraft Industries. Um, and essentially the problem he was trying to solve is they had a, a manual that was several hundred pages. Uh, the Israelis were trying to build a new aircraft. They had several teams of scientists describing the like how this aircraft should behave. But the problem was that if you go to one team and ask them if this button is pressed and this switch is on, what happens, you would get more than one answer. You would get different answers depending on who it was and what team they were on. So obviously that's not a very good way to build an aircraft. Um, so in 1987, David Harrell published this paper called State Charts of Visual Formalism for Complex Systems. Uh, it's like 43-ish pages, um, surprisingly good read for an academic paper, highly recommend it. Um, but what it does is it adds three pieces um, to state charts, to, uh, to state machines, to create state charts. Uh, hierarchy is one of them, so here we have uh, a model for a stoplight where in the red state, you wanna allow pedestrians to cross the street um, and then you add a countdown and then uh, you, you kind of economize the arrows that are going through uh, your state machine. So you have one arrow in there with timer, power outage automatically goes to red, so you have two arrows in there. Um, and then one arrow out. So on timer, you have one in, on timer, one out. And it's deterministic, so it goes from red to green to yellow to red, uh, and so on and so forth. The other is orthogonality. I bet you didn't think you were gonna hear orthogonality in two talks tonight. <laughs> um, so that's just a bonus. Um, so orthogonality is just a, a fancy word for the fact that they don't touch. They're completely discrete, they're separate, they have no knowledge or concept of each other. Um, so separating these out, you can imagine with our uh, bold and italic example earlier, or our bold example earlier with italics, you could have separate machines and those would each have two arrows apiece. Uh, the third piece was communication. Um, I didn't add a slide for that, but basically um, since state, chart, or state machines happen all in one place, State charts separate them out and allow them to communicate with pub-sub, broadcast-style communication. Um, advantages of state charts. This is actually from uh, a paper by NASA called uh, State Machine Modeling of the Space Launch System Solid Rocket Boosters. Um, so they identified five things that, uh, five reasons that they use state machines to model uh, the SRBs. The first was visualized modeling. The second was precise diagrams, automatic code generation, and we'll look in a, in a bit about how you can actually automate test generation, super cool. Um, comprehensive test coverage, and accommodation of late breaking uh, changing requirements. If you have a very explicit visualization of your, your code, it's easy to make changes to that, and those, the people that are making those changes don't have to be uh, completely deep in the code. So one of my favorite parts of that paper is uh, commands and telemetry in the model are dynamically built from Microsoft Excel spreadsheets that define the command name and appropriate data bus. So NASA is building rocket boosters with Excel. <laughs> so that's pretty dope. Well, it works. This is a history diagram of the states. In the I, don't, I can't make any sense of it, but it's in there. Um, so state charts represent the control of your application. Um, Luca Mateus uh, had a really good quote. A state chart is a magic box. You tell it what happened and it tells you what to do. So that goes back to that event state action uh, paradigm. So you define your state chart, an event happens in your application, you tell the state chart about it, it transitions state, it tells you the next state, and then you kind of respond to that. Uh, so there's a tool or a library called XState that's built by David Korshid uh, from Microsoft um, that allows us to use, uh, it's a functional stateless JavaScript finite state machine and state chart library. 
Um, so stateless may be confusing in this sense, um, but what it basically means is that uh, it doesn't keep track of the current state of your application. It's not a state management tool. So you keep track of your current state. So whenever you call a transition, you tell it what state you're in and what happened, and then it tells you what happens next. So it's still up to you. You can use Redux, MobX, you know, Vuex. If you're using Vue, this is a React meetup, but you know, I don't judge. Um, so, that, I mean, it just you know, you keep track of your own state and you just tell it what happened. Um, so we can we can look at what it does. So here we use just uh, JavaScript object to define our state chart. So we define an initial state, um, and then we define the individual states. I cut this off at one just for brevity's sake, um, so that it's easier to read on a screen. But what we have here is a logged in state. Um, and then we have two actions. We have an on entry and on exit action. Um, and then we have the on logout. So that's the only event that our application would respond to. So if we're in the logged in state and we tell it, you know, blue happens, um, it doesn't do anything. It, it just continues to stay in that logged in state. Um, and then the on entry and on exit actions, uh, there's a spec called SCXML, state chart XML. It's not very popular in web dev, but it, uh, it is used heavily in a lot of other um, industries. Uh, so these on entry and on exit actions are actually part of that spec. So when you enter into a state or exit from a state, you can just call a method in your component uh, or call a function um, that will perform an action in response to a transition. Uh, so then we have guards. So for example, if we, if we respond to this submit uh, event, uh, we can put guards on there to say, we only want to go to the loading state if they've input if they've filled out all the filled fields in this form. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to go to an error state. So we can guard transitions uh, based on conditions. And these should be pure functions, so they shouldn't have any side effects. Um, history states. Since we're transitioning through this, we can keep track of those, uh, the previous state of our application. Uh, so Redux does this pretty well with um, just time travel debugger and stuff like that. Um, so if you're using Redux, this is probably not super helpful but it is available. Um, so state charts with React, uh, it may seem like it's a good idea to model your entire application with one state chart, um, but actually the component model of React fits really well with um, componentizing those state charts as well, so building a state chart for a component and telling that component how it should behave. Um, so I attempted to model like an Instagram style application uh, with a single state chart, and this is about as far as I got before I gave up and decided this is a fool's errand. Um, it just doesn't make sense, and it kind of goes uh, counter to the idea of what you're trying to do here, simplifying state. Um, so state charts plus components is a great thing, so writing a state chart for a component is awesome. Uh, Michele Bertoli, who works on ads at Facebook, uh, has an abstraction for xState that is built uh, for React. So you write state chart, uh, X state compatible state charts, um, pass them to, uh, pass them to React Automata, and you get some extra methods and components, lifecycle hooks, things like that, um, that you can use, um, as well as a, uh, testing method that I'll show in a few minutes. So we have this, uh, this stoplight that I've used as an example a couple of times. Um, again, goes from red to green to yellow to red on that timer event. Any other event, it doesn't transition to anything. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So we can model that here just as a, as a JavaScript object. We can define those states and how those transitions happen. And actually what's great is those visualizations that I generated were actually generated using the code that I just showed. So um, David Korshid built an app called XViz um, that you can pass those state chart definitions, those JSON objects to, um, and it will generate your visualizations for you. And you can kind of drag the arrows and boxes around to make it make a little more sense because sometimes it, the way it outputs those is a little bit obtuse because uh, it doesn't really, I mean, it, you know, it's a machine. Um, so this is a component, the stoplight component that I built um, to show how this works. So we have, uh, this is using React Automata with a, an X state, state chart. So we have this, um, and here's the reason I have a clicker. 
Ha, <laughs> laser. Cool. Um, so this handle click method at the top, basically whenever we click the button, it just calls that method, and that method passes that transition to our state chart, and our application responds to that transition. So state there, those components that I have, when the state is in was has a value of red, it just outputs the word red, same for yellow, and same for green, and a button uh, that you can transition those automatically, like just with a click. Uh, and then we wrap it with the with state chart higher order component, pass our state chart to it, and pass the component to it, and then we have um, React Automata work on them. So testing state charts, I mentioned this earlier. Um, what's really great about this is that you can actually take those state charts, pass them to Jest, if you're using Jest. Um, so React Automata gives you this test state chart uh, method. What it does is it uses a shortest path algorithm to go through your state chart, determine all the paths through that state chart, and then cycles your component through all of those states and takes a snapshot of those. So with this one test here, we actually generate three snapshots. Um, I, for again, for brevity's sake, I only took the first one, which is red. Um, so when we're in the red state, you can see that we output the word red, um, and then it just, the rest of it's just a standard just snapshot. Um, I want to clarify that state charts don't mean that you automatically get bug-free code. What it does mean is that you have state in your components that's easier to reason about, and it becomes a little bit easier to determine and find where those bugs are and makes it easier to fix those and avoid regressions in the future. So um, it doesn't make you a bulletproof developer just for using state charts. You still have to follow your practices, but um, it certainly helps kind of make state a little bit more clear. Uh, state charts as a refactor target, I wanted to add that in there because, um, again, since it is something that really fits well with the component model of React, it's one of those things that if you have a really complex component, just one component in your application can use X state and you can start moving towards. So if you have a really complex component that doesn't make a lot of sense, write tests for it, refactor it with state charts, write tests for it again, and now you have um, a component that's a little bit more easy, uh, a little bit easier to reason about. And so some examples of state charts in the wild, uh, or state machines in this case, JavaScript promises. So you have, uh, you execute the promise, you either go into a fulfilled or rejected state, and then a final state. Um, so if you go and look at the uh, documentation for promises, uh, the first section in there is uh, promises as a state machine. Vending machines, you can only get stuff out of them if you put coins in them and press the right buttons. Uh, turnstiles, again, you gotta put a coin in for it to unlock and for you to uh, be able to walk through and then it goes back to the locked state. Traffic lights, we've seen that several times. NASA Space Launch System, I mentioned that. Regex is a state machine, actually, um, and you can see this if you, again, look at the documentation for Regex. Video games uh, have been using state machines and state charts for decades, um, so it's, it's very common uh, in, in that industry. Uh, Tesla manufacturing, I actually went and looked to see who mentioned state machines in, uh, job, in job descriptions. Tesla, in their manufacturing plant, talks, uh, I forget the job description, but it explicitly says you should be able to work with state machines. Uh, computational biology, uh, actually people and things can be modeled as state machines. Uh, so it's pretty dope. Uh, aviation, I mentioned that earlier with the Israel aircraft systems. Uh, resources, that state charts paper by David Harrell is kind of what started this whole thing off. The the book, Constructing the User Interface with State Charts, it's on Scribd or something like that. I think it's a textbook, because if you go and look on Amazon for it, it's like $200, so it's silly. So I just got a PDF off Scribd. Um, SCXML, there's a spec. Uh, Statecharts.github.io is run by a guy named uh, Eric Mogensen, um, who's a contributor to XState, uh, and it has a ton of resources about, about state charts. Uh, and then there's a Spectrum community, if you're interested, come join us, hang out, chit chat, ask questions. Um, I'm actually launching a course on this stuff, uh, so it'll be out like this week. Um, and then David Korshid, who I mentioned earlier, he and I are gonna be doing workshops um, on this stuff. 
So there's a form, a Google Doc or a Google Form there if you're interested. It's just learningstatemachines.com slash workshop. Ask questions, anything, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Um, last thing, uh, David Korshid again, who makes several appearances in this talk now, um, had a really good quote that I liked called, uh, where he said, make impossible states impossible. And that's it. Questions? All right, and real quick, since I'm paying attention this time, if you raise your hand for a question, I'll bring a microphone around to you. So we'll start with this guy. He's kind of shady. <laughs> uh, so I saw there was history in your example. Is it okay to use that history to determine a like tr state transition? I, I have a use case where that seemed necessary or Absolutely. valuable. Is that okay yeah? To do? So um, a good example would be with a with a stoplight. Again, um, if the power goes out, you want to flash red. So and then when this power comes back on, you don't want every light to be red. So you can just transition back into that history state where it was when it died, uh, uh, essentially. Um, so yeah, definitely. Anyone else? Questions, comments? From Did I answer everything? <laughs> okay. I cool. think their brains hurt. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> cool. Thanks, John. Thanks again. Thank y'all. All right, uh, just to wrap up real quick, uh, if you're still hungry, come eat pizza. There's still some left. Um, if you, I said this at the beginning, but I'll say it again. Uh, if you have talk ideas, you're interested in speaking, please come find me, find a handful of us. Uh, could I have the organizing team stand up for a sec? So uh, these are a couple of the guys we all Uh, we work together to put this together each month. Uh, we also have Sam, who's not here tonight. He's off the grid, but watching the live stream. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Um, uh, if you're interested, we can always use help, uh, whether that's just like on site, uh, emceeing, uh, working on a website, talking to people on talks, um, anything like that. Anything that you're willing to do, we're happy to have you do. So uh, please come find one of us. And uh, unless there's anything else, we'll see you guys next month. Cool. Thanks, everybody.